Copper Sun by Sharon Draper, Chapter 35, Dirt and Clay. The next evening, feeling full of energy, the three young travelers headed out with a renewed enthusiasm. The forest had turned to deep pine, the tall evergreens casting thin shadows from the moonlight. In the distance, lights from farmhouses flickered. Hush Puppy seems to know he is the hero of the moment, Polly said with a smile as the dog bounded after every unfortunate rabbit or squirrel that crossed their path but he's too full to catch much now. Amari laughed softly. Tidbit chased the dog merrily. His high spirits returned, and they all seemed to relax as they made their way slowly through the cool, dark night. They crossed another shallow waterway where the soft river mud soothed their tired feet. For four more nights, they traveled smoothly, heading ever farther away from the plantation of Percival Derby. They had no more huge feasts, but the leftover pieces of Cooked rabbit lasted a few days, and roots and tubers were plentiful every time they reached a the river. Mari was glad when it was not the rainy season. Mari was glad that it was not the rainy season. The small streams they crossed would have been roaring rivers. In addition, Amari figured out a way to catch crayfish in the shallows, the tangy flesh a delicious treat as they began their seemingly unending nighttime treks. But she was tired, tired of walking, of being uncertain, and of feeling sick all the time. Every muscle in her body cried out for rest. The night was unusually warm, and Amari had broken out in a sweat. She didn't think she could keep this up much longer. She had no way of knowing how far they had gone or how much farther they still had to travel. She had nothing to grab onto for support. It reminded her of being on the ship, where it was impossible to determine time or place, just the endless sea. She was fearful also, but she did not want to share her worries with the others. What would happen if they were found? She wiped her brow and tried to think positively, showing brave smiles to Polly and Tidbit. Just as she let herself relax, however, her worst fears, worst fears became reality. As they walked on, Amari could see nothing but shadows, some lighter than others. The trees, long, slim silhouettes, seemed to guide them most of the time. But sometimes the branches looked like arms with hands of many fingers, ready to attack. And then suddenly, the branches of a short, sturdy tree moved. Just as Amari jumped, watch one branch grabbed her wrist. She cried out and tried to pull her arm free. Polly instantly grasped Tidbit's hand and pulled him into the darkness. Amari screamed again and tried to turn, but she couldn't get free. Then she heard a voice full of venom and danger. Where do you think you're going? As Amari twisted to escape, she found herself face to face with Clay Derby. Let me go, Amari exploded, but Clay held her arm as firmly as the shackles she had once worn as, she pulled, as he pulled her close to the trunk of the tree. I've been looking for you and that white girl you run off with for a long time now, Clay drawled. My father would have been proud of me, God rest his soul. How you find, Amari asked in furious frustration. It wasn't hard, you leave footprints the size of a horse. He laughed with disdain, spat on the ground, and pulled a rope out from his doublet. He first tied Amari's arms together, then tied her to the tree, pressing himself against her to keep her still. How you know where to look, she wanted to know. Oh, the doctor made up that cock and bull story about high, highwaymen and seeing you all head north, but he is a poor excuse for a liar. Everybody went north looking for you, but I figured you might try something stupid, like running south. Why you care, Amari asked with quiet anger. You are mine, gal. His leer turned into a confused scowl. I have missed you, Mina, he had admitted. Didn't you miss me a little? I thought you liked me. He touched her face gently. In spite of her fury, Amari was amazed at the plaintive tone in his voice. Why you not just let me be, she asked angrily. Clay leaned very close to her face. Because I aim to reclaim what's mine. You hear me, Mina? Amina took a, Amari took a deep breath, closed her eyes, and this time it was her turn to spit. She spat directly in his face. Clay roared and slapped her so hard that her head bounced back against the tree trunk. She felt herself fading into a faint, but she felt victorious. Clay slapped her again, bringing her back to full consciousness. Amari glared at him. From the shadows, Amari could hear Hush Puppy growl. Where is that child? Clay asked Amari as he looked around. Amari looked at him with narrow eyes. Dead, she said emphatically. 
I don't think so, Clay replied calmly. That would save me the trouble of dashing his head against a tree. I followed your footprints, remember? Amari struggled against the ropes. She had never been so angry. If he hurt Tidbit, if she would kill him, she vowed. And where is the white girl? Clay asked as he watched her struggle. He seemed to be amused. She leave us, go north, Amari lied. You know, you're as poor a liar as the doctor, Clay told her as he ran his hand down her arm. I shall enjoy punishing you when we return to Derbyshire Farms. I am master there, and I am master there now, you know. My father died suddenly, not long after you ran off. Massa Derby dead? Amari asked with surprise. She wondered if Mrs. Derby had breathed a sigh of relief. Amari lowered her head. Is it wrong to be glad that someone is dead, she thought. Yes, the doctor said it was his heart, but I, don't, I, but I believe he was poisoned, Clay said ominously. Amari peered into the darkness and prayed that Polly and Tidbit would not try to save her and get caught themselves. Again, she heard Hush Puppy growl from the darkness of the woods, quietly but with menace. What happened when we go back? Amari asked, trying to keep Clay talking. Oh, you'll be punished severely. Perhaps a brand on your face, or maybe the removal of a finger or toe. I have not decided yet. Amari felt her heart quicken, but she refused to let Clay see that she was scared. I fully intend to teach you the folly of trying to run away from me. But tonight, he said, his voice dropping low, I intend to make, I intend to make up for lost time. I, have I really have missed you, gal. He stroked her leg, and Amari kicked at him. Undeterred, Clay put his hand on Amari's other leg. A dusty blonde shadow erupted from the woods at that moment, both hands shakily holding the musket. Polly closed her eyes and squeezed the trigger. The sound was deafening. Amari screamed. Clay sank to the ground with a moan. He be dead? Amari asked fearfully as they crept close to him. Polly, her face showing both terror and surprise, dropped the gun, then fell to her knees and turned Clay over. No, he is not dead, she declared with relief. It's a good thing I am such a poor shot. I didn't want to hurt him, just frighten him away. Clay's eyes fluttered and he groaned softly. The bullets barely grazed the size of his head. He will be fully conscious soon. We must hurry. She tore at the knots that held Amari. Amari looked at Polly with gratitude, amazement, and new respect. I not know you so wild, Polly grinned. I didn't know it either. I just thought I had to do something quick and sudden. Then she got down to business. It is his turn to be tied, she suggested. He get loose soon, yes, Amari asked. Probably, Polly replied. We don't have much rope. I suppose he will be able to undo the knots eventually, but at least we will have some time to get away. He should die, Amari declared, no regret in her voice. Maybe so, but it is not for us to do, Polly replied. They pulled Clay over to the tree and bound him as tightly as they could. We must get out of here quickly, Polly said. Maybe someone may have heard the gunfire. As they backed away from him, he began to stir. He'd be waking up, Amari whispered frantically. Polly grabbed Clay's knapsack and tossed the gun inside it. We must flee. If he gets loose, he will surely find us and kill us. Maybe not, Amari replied. She pointed to a spot just beyond Clay's thigh where a large rattlesnake slithered toward him. What should we do, Polly whispered. Nothing, Amari, Amari replied quietly. Clay opened his eyes and focused slowly on Amari, Polly, and Tidbit sitting a few feet away from him. A trickle of blood oozed from the wound on his head. He pulled at his restraints. How dare you! He roared as he became more became as he became more aware of what they had done. He yanked at the ropes. I'll kill you for this. I don't think so, Polly replied. Mark my words, you'll pay for this, he warned viciously as he tugged at the rope some more. When we get back, I'll throw that boy in his mother's cooking pot and make her watch him die. We not go back, Amari told him clearly. Oh, yes, you are. Clay swore as he continued to struggle with the ropes. You can't even tie a decent knot, he crawled triumphantly, freeing one arm. Even if you run, I will find you and catch you, and I plan to spend the rest of my life making you suffer. Rest of life might not be long. Amari observed quietly. The snake, unmoving, coiled, tensed, and ready only inches from Clay's leg. Clay, <laughs> Clay looked directly at Amari, his face a mask of rage and confusion. 
I tried to be kind to you, he told her. How can you repay me like this? She looked at him with pity. You just not understand. Angrily, Clay continued to wiggle and struggle with the ropes that held him. Then he turned his head and spotted the snake. He froze. The stink was motionless as well. Amari looked at Polly. Polly looked at Tidbit. They all looked towards the woods. In silent agreement, they hurried away from Clay.